Tonight, a shocking display of gun violence in Toronto. A brazen targeted attack leaves five teens wounded. It's terrifying. Like, there's little kids around here. How can the city stop the shootings? A big step towards impeachment. The House approves taking the inquiry public. After some high-profile criticism, is Andrew Scheer's leadership under threat? At issue is standing by. And our kids need to learn how to be gritty. And in Montreal, trick-or-treaters brave the rain and hit the streets, proving there's no postponing Halloween. This is The Nation. Toronto is on track to hit a pretty disturbing record. More shootings than ever before in a single year. And with three violent attacks, including one late tonight, there are serious questions about whether the city can get a handle on this. One incident targeting five teenagers was captured on camera. Ellen Morrow begins our coverage with the security video. The video is chilling. The gunman's actions calculated. These men opening fire on five teenagers before fleeing a Toronto apartment building. A shooting so brazen, the police chief rushed to the scene, calling it a targeted attack. My concern is that there are three people right now that uh, have no issue shooting a firearm in the city of Toronto. A city struggling to stop rising gun crime. This morning, just a little over 12 hours later, and only a few minutes away from the first shooting, another shooting happened at this apartment complex behind me. One man was brought to hospital. The victims from both shootings are expected to live. That doesn't take away the fear. It's terrifying. Like, there's little kids around here. Like, the park's right beside us. So far this year, there have been 398 shootings, 33 people killed, and more than 194 injured. I remain deeply troubled by it, but I'm also honest in saying that I don't have a magic answer, and I'm not aware of anybody else who does. After a rash of shootings this summer, including at the Rafters Victory Parade, the three levels of government launched Project Community Space. It meant, among other things, increased police presence in areas affected by guns. The project was supposed to end today, but given the violence, it's been extended indefinitely. We will be staying the course on doing the things that we have to do. Uh, support for the police, uh, you know, which is something that has been vital. Throwing money at policing is not going to solve this. And neither would a municipal handgun ban enabled by the Liberal government, says this anti-gun activist. We need investment in community. Uh, we need investment in families. We need uh, more positive relationships with community. And tonight, police need any information about these suspects. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. And developing late tonight, there is word of yet another shooting. Paramedics are confirming two male teenagers have serious injuries. They have been transported to hospital. So the gunshots were heard at the back of a building in Toronto's East End. That makes eight people shot in the past 24 hours. More now on that terrible story out of Winnipeg, where a three-year-old boy was stabbed in his bed in the middle of the night. Police have arrested the man they believe responsible. Nelly Gonzalez spoke with the boy's family today about how they're coping. Family and friends held a vigil outside a hospital where a little boy is fighting for his life. Like, how can a human do such a thing to an innocent, sweet baby that was sleeping? The boy's aunt says he remains in critical condition in hospital. In my heart, I feel like he's doing much better than yesterday. CBC News is not naming the aunt to protect the identity of the child. The family says the toddler was stabbed in the neck in his bed. Today, 33-year-old Dan Jensen was charged with attempted murder. It's believed the man targeted the boy after an argument with the mom earlier in the night. Jensen is also charged with assaulting the boy's mother. The suspect was previously known to the child's mother. They were involved in a relationship. Uh, he is not the biological father of the child. And uh, she suffered a number of injuries as a result of the assault on her. According to court documents, Jensen was out on bail when the attack happened. In July, he was charged with assault with a weapon and uttering threats against the boy's mother. He was ordered not to have contact with her. 
The boy's aunt said Jensen would not leave her sister alone. Dan is, uh, was a, a jealous man. This is the third violent crime involving a child in Winnipeg in the last week. Over the weekend, a 14-year-old girl was stabbed to death at a Halloween party and a baby shot inside a home. That baby is expected to live. The boy's mother in this case is recovering from her injuries and hasn't left her son's side. Nellie Gonzalez, CBC News, Winnipeg. In the United States, a big step today in the Donald Trump impeachment inquiry. In a divided House of Representatives, a vote passed setting ground rules for how to move the inquiry out from behind closed doors and right into the public eye. At issue is whether the president pressured a foreign leader to investigate his political rival. As Arthi Pohl shows us, Trump's team is already crying foul. The resolution is adopted without objection. That vote puts Donald Trump on track to possibly become the third president to be impeached. Today, the House takes the next step forward as we establish the procedures for open hearings so that the public can see the facts for themselves. All but two Democrats who hold a majority in the House supported the resolution. No Republicans did. It sets out rules for making the inquiry that has been happening behind closed doors public. Republicans had demanded that, even storming a secure room where testimony was underway last week. Today, though, they say the new rules are partisan. The president has had no rights inside these hearings. Under the guidelines, Republicans can cross-examine witnesses and can subpoena their own. But House Democrats get veto power. The rules also enable public hearings and the release of previously gathered witness testimony. If, after a fair and thorough inquiry, the allegations against President Trump are found to be true, they would represent a profound offense against the Constitution and against the people of this country. At the heart of the investigation, if Trump did in fact act inappropriately and try to pressure Ukraine into investigating former Vice President and presidential candidate Joe Biden and his son. Already, some witnesses have corroborated the claims. But shortly after the House vote, this from the president on British radio. No, the uh, transcript of the, of the call that I had with the Ukrainian president is a perfect and, a, and totally appropriate document. And they're using that to try and impeach the president of the United States. All of this is playing out ahead of the 2020 presidential election, and some strategists say it sets the stage for an even more divisive presidential campaign than when Trump was first elected. Division that could further energize Trump's base. Arthi Pohl, CBC News, Washington. So from this point, the whole process could actually move very quickly. There is no set date for when the public hearings could begin, but U.S. media believe it could be possibly as early as mid-November. Some star witnesses could be asked to testify again in public, like acting U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine Bill Taylor and his predecessor, Marie Yovanovitch. Republicans would have a chance to question the witnesses, and when it's all done, possibly as early as the end of November, a report will go to the Judiciary Committee, which will decide whether to recommend the House impeach Trump. If so, the whole investigation moves to the Republican-controlled Senate, which has the final say on whether Trump is removed from office. Interestingly, this is all happening at such a crucial time. Sunday marks one year until the U.S. presidential election. So this weekend, I'll be hosting from Washington with some special coverage. Now, Arthi mentioned Trump called into that British radio show while well, he was talking to a familiar political ally, the Brexit Party's Nigel Farage. Trump also weighed in on the upcoming snap election in that country, and Trump called British Prime Minister Boris Johnson a fantastic man, then said this about Johnson's opposition. Corbyn would be so bad for your country. He'd be so bad, he'd take you in such a bad way. He'd take you into such bad places. Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn responded on Twitter, writing in part, Donald Trump is trying to interfere in Britain's election to get his friend Boris Johnson elected. UK party leaders haven't been able to strike a Brexit deal, so Johnson called for a snap election to let voters decide who should steer the process. To California now, where the fires, the ferocious winds and fears of a middle-of-the-night exodus just will not let up. 
unprecedented Santa Ana winds turned small brush fires into infernos in Southern California again overnight. The flames racing down hillsides into residential areas east of L.A. in just minutes, forcing people and animals to run for their lives. In some areas, though, the smoke has cleared, the danger is over, and with evacuation orders lifted, residents are now returning to see if they still have homes. Kim Brunhuber was there. My neighbor's house uh, completely burned down. Marek Dobrovolsky, aghast at the destruction he's seeing for the first time in person. We woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning, I smelled smoke, and uh, we decided to run, run out right away, take the kids. Several homes on his street in the Los Angeles suburb of Brentwood burned down Monday. And just like this Californian with a doorbell camera, he was able to watch as the flames got closer and firefighters worked to save his home. It must have been a surreal experience to see this happening in real time from your door. Yeah, it's a surreal experience, a scary experience, and uh, I don't wish anybody to go through it. The trees of my neighbors are scorched. He's been allowed to return home, but just this morning, others in nearby cities were being told to get out. Before dawn, two more fast-moving wildfires exploded in Southern California. In San Bernardino, Matthew Valdivia's home is now just a smoking pile of twisted metal and ash. It's, it's devastating. Our fireplace where we had our first Christmas and our Thanksgiving, and just, it just it sucks, man. There is some welcome news. Forecasters say the ferocious winds which have spread fires across the state seem to have peaked, but they warn extreme fire weather conditions are expected to last here in parts of Southern California until tomorrow. In Northern California's wine country, the winds have already died down. The massive Kincaid fire is 60% contained. There is still a risk for the fire to spread, but if you look at the numbers for the last several days, the fire has not gotten significantly larger. Most mandatory evacuations have now been lifted. Thank you for saving my house and my neighbor's house. Back in Brentwood, Dobrovolsky is marching up and down his street past the still smoking homes of his neighbors, shaking the hand of every firefighter he meets. He knows how lucky he is. He can see for himself what could have been. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. All over Canada tonight, little ones and some big ones headed out on candy-finding missions. But in Quebec, this Halloween brought a whole lot of confusion, too. As Sarah Levitt explains, a move to postpone the holiday has some parents scratching their heads and some kids cashing in. Wow, I love your costume. The weather wasn't perfect, but these kids braved it anyway for Halloween. Extremely happy because I love candy and I love to go trick-or-treating. We'll they went out despite a move from Quebec mayors. With heavy rain and strong winds in the forecast, they tried to postpone Halloween to tomorrow. Cue the controversy. It's Halloween. I mean, why wait an extra day? I remember uh, being a, a child uh, in snow and rain. We went out. Nothing bothered us. Tonight, there were moments of heavy rain, but... Tomorrow, arguably, may be worse than today in Quebec. And Montreal is known to have, like, unpredictable weather. And our kids need to learn how to be gritty. Montreal's mayor defended her decision today, tweeting, Halloween gate is a situation of damned if you do, damned if you don't. The last-minute change led to some uncertainty for parents. After a call-out on Facebook, one mom created a map for her neighborhood. It's supposed to tell them where candy is available tonight and where it's available tomorrow. In some houses, Halloween isn't postponed, it's extended. We would definitely never turn away a kid. And frankly, if we have leftover candy, we're going to do it again tomorrow night if there's other kids. <laughs> This confusion has led some kids to see an opportunity. So who's going trick-or-treating tonight? And who's going trick-or-treating tomorrow? And who's doing both? It's kind of a good idea and a bad idea. The good idea is that we get to get double the candy that we usually get. And then the bad thing is, is that you're basically taking it away on the real night of Halloween. For these kids, not even a mayor's warning can stop them from dressing up and snagging all that free candy. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. More news ahead tonight, including the push to never roll back the clock again in B.C.
as the province takes a step towards a permanent daylight savings time. What health experts are saying about that idea? And later, a marketplace investigation puts brand name sneakers to the test. Does a higher price actually mean higher performance? And a new video with a message from Alex Trebek. What he now says about his pancreatic cancer and the symptoms he may have missed. We're back in two minutes. Welcome back. So don't forget that this weekend, the majority of Canadians will be setting their clocks back when daylight saving comes to an end. But BC is moving forward with a plan to end the semi-annual ritual. Now, it's not a done deal yet, but today the province introduced legislation that would allow it to stay with one time zone all year long. Greg Rasmussen weighs the pros and the cons. The sun's not quite up yet on this BC farm, but work is underway. Looks like they're hungry this morning. The cattle don't care what the clock says, but for workers, the time change can be irritating. Because it always messes people's lives up. We don't want to go one hour back, one hour ahead. Bob Hopcott's local farm association is one of many BC groups in favor of ending the twice yearly ritual. He says there's no real point anymore to changing the clocks, which goes back to a World War I effort to save energy. I hope maybe next spring it goes back to daylight savings and then that's it. Uh, today's a very good day for, for those who are tired of changing their clocks. Uh, we a recent survey carried out by the BC Columbia government showed 93% of respondents want to do away with springing ahead and falling back. The consultation made it fairly clear. Most people believe that daylight savings time will give them more light during their working day, and that's the direction we're going to go in. Another big reason for this, California and other Pacific Coast states are considering similar measures. And BC doesn't want to be left out of sync. Well, I think this time shift is definitely a health issue. Experts say the twice yearly switch has links to sleep disorders and depression. But permanent daylight saving could cause a different set of health problems caused by a lack of morning sunlight. The sun will not rise on December 21st until 9 a.m. That is very late in the day for a sunrise. And so everybody will be getting up in the dark to go to work, to go to school, whatever. BC says it will consider the impact on human health and the economy before making the final switch, with other provinces watching closely. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. All right, now let's go to our national newsroom in Vancouver, where Ian is following several stories from across Canada tonight. And Adrian, let's start in Alberta, where one of Canada's oldest energy companies is moving south and changing its name. Calgary-based Encana will soon become Ovinta, headquartered out of the United States. Its CEO says the move will not affect staff or spending plans in Canada, but it will expose the stock to bigger investor pools. Alberta's energy minister blames Prime Minister Trudeau. The signal that he has sent on the importance of oil and gas to Canada has been abysmal. And it's very difficult for investors to want to uh, have confidence in Canada. And Canada CEO says the move has nothing to do with politics. Saskatchewan's highest court has denied an appeal from the young man responsible for that 2016 shooting rampage in Laloche. The shooter was 17 at the time. He killed four people and injured seven others in the remote Saskatchewan community. He pleaded guilty and was sentenced as an adult to life in prison with no parole for at least 10 years. He appealed, arguing he should have been sentenced as a youth, but that was denied today. His lawyers are now considering whether to appeal to the Supreme Court. And a new candid message tonight from Jeopardy! host Alex Trebek. I wish I had known sooner that the persistent stomach pain I experienced prior to my diagnosis was a symptom of pancreatic cancer. The message is part of a minute-long public service announcement that Trebek released with the World Pancreatic Cancer Coalition. The 79-year-old says he's hoping to raise global awareness of the risks and symptoms of the disease. Earlier this month, the longtime game show host revealed that he had begun his second round of chemotherapy. A big merger in the automotive world, the details and other international stories in 20 minutes. All right, time for a quick break. Up next, Ad Issue is here. Peter McKay did not mince words earlier this week, so should Andrew Scheer be worried about his job? And Rosie's next with Andrew Chantal and Althea.
And later, we catch up with Humboldt bus crash survivor Ryan Strashnitsky as he prepares to travel to Thailand for an unusual medical procedure. For the first time since last week's election, it was only a week ago, uh, parties are coming together for some postmortems, caucus meetings, asking what went wrong, what worked, and strategizing, of course, for the weeks ahead. So how are they handling the criticism? Who are they turning to for advice? It's Thursday. It's at issue. Chantal Hébert is in Montreal. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto. And Althea Raj also here in Ottawa tonight. Okay, I want to start with the Conservative Party because it seems sort of the, the hottest at the moment, uh, <laughs> if I can use that turn of phrase. There have been uh, some anonymous calls for Andrew Scheer to, to leave, a couple of public ones. Uh, and then this comment yesterday by former cabinet minister, former leadership contender, although not in the last race, Peter McKay. And he said this. Take a listen. Yeah, to use a good Canadian analogy, it was like having a breakaway on an open net and missing the net. <laughs> People did not want to talk about women's reproductive rights. They didn't want to talk about revisiting the issue of same-sex marriage. And yet that was thrust onto the agenda uh, and hung around Andrew Shear's neck like a, a stinking albatross. So at around midnight uh, last night, McKay then went on to tweet this. Uh, he said that he's repeatedly said he supports Andrew Shear. He worked hard to help him campaign. Reports of me art organizing are false. Um, so that was the way he tried to put the, the toothpaste back in the tube there. Um, Andrew, Andrew Coyne, I'll start with you. Um, I mean, I, I, you should never actually wield the knife if you are trying to get the job, I guess. But should Andrew Scheer be worried about this, th this buzz that we are hearing? And in the case of Peter McKay, a very public one. Yeah, I mean, I, it's not yet reached the stage where somebody says that uh, he's entitled to make his own decision. Uh, but we are also hearing, uh, I think we're getting past the stage of he needs better advisors. It, it's that kind of low rumbling. You start seeing riding executives, and you start seeing uh, the odd MP or former MP start, starting to, to do the running on it. Having Peter McKay out there, I mean, I suppose he didn't, wasn't aware that this would be reported back in Canada, but uh, <laughs> he had to have been. Uh, so this is pretty, actually pretty high level rumbling when you've got Peter McKay out there. I agree with you, there's, there's risks for him in being seen to do this. On the other hand, Mulroney used to regularly put the knife into Joe Clark and he wound up taking the crown. Um, <laughs> with, with much the same song and dance about, oh, I have nothing but support for Mr. Yes. Clark, and then, yes. you know, he'd be briefing reporters to the contrary. Yeah. So what should Andrew be sure be doing right now, Chantal? Uh, reflecting upon his future and, and whether he can keep uh, that caucus, but also that party in line with a reasonable chance of doing better in the next election. There is, um, there are those voices, uh, some of them public, but there, there are not very many voices standing up for Andrew Scheer, frankly, no. beyond the obligatory, uh, oh, I stand by him. Uh, and I think it has become abundantly clear over the past uh, week and a half uh, that if Mr. Scheer were to say that he has decided to resign, a lot of people would say he worked very hard, but uh, those tears that they would have would be crocodile tears. Uh, Althea, what are, what are you hearing uh, from crocodile tears or otherwise? <laughs> Yeah, I think what's really interesting is that uh, MPs who have been re-elected are themselves saying behind the scenes that they think that uh, Mr. Scheer should go and even musing aloud about who could possibly replace him and who would be interesting and who are like uh, almost like a um, fantasy football uh, team cock potential leader would be. Um, and so that, I think if Mr. Scheer really uh, aggressively wants to hang on to his job, then he needs to reach beyond the sort of core inner circle and some of the more veteran voices that he assembled in Ottawa this week and really try to get that caucus under control. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I, should, I should point out that no one is brave enough to say these things uh, with their name attached, or very few people, very few people but are brave enough. But it's early. Now, yeah. For now, it's For now. a week and a half and yeah. we're hearing it. Uh, if you look at the body language of that Quebec caucus, I didn't get a sense that there was anyone in there that yeah. was uh, kind of willing to go public saying we need Andrew Scheer to stay. 
one of the and decisions. he hasn't uh, Albia publicly Landry, said yep. he hasn't publicly said I think what a lot of people would have liked him to say especially uh, Quebec ca candidates and other candidates in Ontario for example like a mea culpa like I'm really sorry I should have handled the same-sex marriage issue differently I should have handled the abortion issue differently we didn't hear that from him in his exit interviews coming out of the election campaign last week one of the okay. decisions for that caucus to make at its first meeting is whether it wants to have the provisions of the reform act apply to it last time around they had Michael th Chong's bill that's right last Michael time around they voted to, to to accept I think all but one the one being the leadership review but if a majority of the caucus were to vote to adopt the leadership review then they themselves could exercise it themselves and all the, the party would have left to do would be to choose a new leader I think that's relevant because I think the party has a real choice to make about whether they want to stumble through the next six months with this kind of sustained bloodletting where they don't they can't focus their energies on the government they're just focusing on inward fighting or whether they want to get this over with quickly. And remember uh, yes. uh, John Turner who faced the caucus rebellion, people signed a letter, caucus members, to ask him to quit, and then none of them would own up, or almost none of them would own up to their signature. So. <laughs> uh, the end, let's turn to the NDP. That, that caucus met in Ottawa uh, this week as well. There were defeated MPs who were also there. There seemed to be more of a recognition that perhaps they had not won the election, as opposed to what we've been hearing for the past week. Here's what some of them had to say about uh, Jagmeet Singh. I think the caucus is solid behind him. He, he was exemplary as a campaigner. He was not present enough before the campaign. Uh, he was not seen in Quebec except for uh, say by elections or one appear, appearance at Tumon Appal. I want him to come in Quebec as soon as possible because I don't want to be alone there. I think that maybe we caught fire a little too late for people to know and to see uh, what we were representing. So, I mean, there's some support, certainly. No one's calling for him to leave, Althea, but there is some recognition some, now. Some people about... are. <laughs> okay, all right, you go ahead then. <laughs> well, Carl Belanger, for example, who was um, Leighton's press secretary and then <sighs> principal secretary yeah, and then yeah. uh, national director of the party, uh, penned uh, a column earlier this month last week, I guess it would be, yep. saying that Jaimeet Singh should resign. And in fact, that if the bar that uh, was set for Thomas Mulcair to step down is being applied to Mr. Singh, then he should step down. And especially when you look at what happened in Quebec, where the party lost all of his seats but one, uh, that uh, Mr. Singh sh should be shown the door. I, I don't get that's a general sense held at all in the party. Yeah, yeah. But the question about Quebec remains a very important one. And today we saw um, Melissa Bruno, who was Mr. Singh's assistant at Queen's Park, who was the national uh, director, announced that she is leaving. It was in a way the worst possible result for the NDP in that it wasn't such a disaster that they could then sweep out the leader and start afresh. And yet they didn't do very well at all yeah. compared to certainly where they were last time. Uh, you know, Mr. Singh, for months prior to the election, was stumbling around from one mistake and one accident to the next. It was not, it was a deeply unimpressive leader. He had a few good days in the campaign, basically, in which people took a look at him and decided they liked the cut of his jib. But the question is going to be, looking forward, is, is which is going to be the, the Jagmeet Singh that people are going to see? Are they going to see the guy that they liked during the campaign, or are they going to see the guy they thought didn't really know his briefs very well prior to the election? And if it's the latter, then, the, then they're stuck with a leader that can't really light a fire under voters and can't really advance yards with them. Uh, Chantal. And he doesn't have a lot of room for more accidents, uh, not in a minority government, yeah. where if you uh, overplay your hand, you can either embarrass yourself or end up uh, in a very bad place. And in the case of the NDP, uh, it's going to be a balancing act to look like it's having influence in the House of Commons while avoiding being uh, pushed against the wall by the Liberals saying, you really want an election, guys? Which they can't have, uh, for the record. And I do think Mr. Singh is going to have to think about a leadership review vote because he may lose uh, support from Quebec, support from Saskatchewan. Not sure that uh, Toronto uh, yes. New Democrats are excited over not being on the map. Uh, yeah. So, um, lots to think about in that shake-up, possibly, to bring some uh, experienced hands with the minority rule. Okay, I got, I got like two minutes and I want to do a quick round on the Liberals, just on the fact that we now know two people that are helping them, Anne McClellan and the, the ambassador to, to France, Isabelle Houdon, and we also know that they're taking their time, which is something that they didn't do the last time. Uh, they're giving themselves a lot of time to form a cabinet and figure out what's next. What, what should we take from that, Althea? I think it's good that they're taking their time. They obviously have um, new problems to deal with, Alberta and Saskatchewan, you know, how, how to respond to what voters have told them in those provinces, uh, prime among them. 
Uh, I am perplexed at the choice of Anne McClellan and Isabelle Houdon, to be completely frank. I mean, I understand uh, Ambassador Houdon has some business ties, and Anne McClellan seems like she's the only liberal uh, that people know in Alberta. <laughs> and it would have been, I think, interesting to see other people around uh, that group. I hear Tony Dean, uh, Senator uh, Dean, has been also serving as an advisor, but he doesn't seem to want to say that publicly. Oops. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I, I don't know. I mean, the team that is left is a pretty risk adverse team and these choices of advisors are kind of a risk adverse choice so mm -hmm. what does that tell us about where the government is thinking i think that's interesting chantal mm -hmm. for all uh, of uh, the qualities of ambassador you don't i think if you asked around and the quebec political networks not quebec inc people would be puzzled as to mm -hmm. what that she brings to the table that uh, is so needed in these circumstances uh, so where this goes from there, I thought they were taking their time, frankly, and that goes to what Althea was saying, so that they spend as little time and possibly no time at all uh, sitting in the House of Commons before Christmas. Andrew, last uh, I think precisely that's the reason why they should be calling back the House. I understand why they wouldn't want to, but this is a government with a very weakened mandate. I think it is an obligation to, to test the confidence of the House, to show that, it, in fact, it has, has the support of the House. I think it has an obligation to deal with some of the divisions and resentments that have been exposed by this election and not just let them simmer uh, for months and weeks on end. That being said, I mean, th I hope they've also learned some of the lessons of their first term, which was, uh, you know, when they put together their cabinet, they put together a lot, put a lot of very inexperienced people, politically inexperienced people in the cabinet, uh, possibly as a result of that or possibly just because of the way government runs in can Canada nowadays, everything was run through the, uh, through the Prime Minister's office. It was notoriously centralized, possibly even more than Stephen Harper's. Um, that is not going to work as well in this, in this kind of atmosphere. They need experienced hands around them, need to be able to trust uh, people like their house leader, whoever they appoint as that, yeah. uh, and they need to recognize that they're not in a situation now where they can just run things, ram things through. They're going to have to negotiate on everything they put through, and that's not in this, this group's DNA. They're going to need to really change the way that they've approached approach governing. Okay, guys, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, there's lots going on, but it's all sort of behind the scenes. So uh, it's good to have everybody there weighing in. Before we go, be sure to subscribe to At Issue, the podcast for extra content. This week, we're going to talk a little bit about Quebec's values test. Look for it on iTunes and a major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. All right, we're back in two minutes with a marketplace investigation. Are brand name sneakers worth the price tag? We will put them to the test right after the break. Well, the Toronto Raptors are into a new season, and basketball fans are also lacing up their kicks, some of them pretty costly. Marketplace put 11 pairs through their paces to show if they're actually worth it. Asha Tomlinson brings us the results. I want to know how you think your shoes help your performance on the floor. Be able to move and stuff, like that's what I really go for. For me, it's got to be low top. Um, just the way my feet work. I mean, I'm nothing without my shoes. <laughs> Same goes for this family of five. The Wades live for basketball and go through a lot of sneakers every season. Is the most expensive shoe always the one to buy? Oh, there's the budget aspect of it. I mean, they have to be within reason. It's mostly name, prestige, colorways. So I try to avoid those, you know, and try to find the... Mid-range. Yeah, try mostly. to find a mid-range, right? Because top-of-the-line shoes for Greg and his sons would cost more than $600 in one shot. This time, boy, let's go. The Deers like to shop around, too, for their young baller, Jakari. I think the shoe's more expensive for a reason, right? They put in work and in technology, and the science and all that behind it. So we put it to the test, sending 11 pairs of basketball shoes from Nike, Adidas, and Under Armour to a lab in Calgary to see if more expensive sneakers mean more of an advantage on the court. The shoes range in price from $80 to 240 bucks, and some are worn by NBA's biggest stars like LeBron James and Steph Curry. We can have an indication by doing these mechanical tests how this particular shoe is going to function or perform. After days of testing, we reveal the results to our families. First up, 
the Nike LeBron 16 at 240 bucks. Wow. So the LeBron did really well in cushioning, stiffness, and it also did well in energy return. Jakari, you were the only one who picked LeBron for overall performance. Yeah, I think I made a good choice. Are more expensive shoes that much better? The Wade seem to be on side. If it comes out that a $240 shoe is a lot better than a $160 shoe, I'm not going to deprive my kids of that additional performance. Asha Tomlinson, CBC News, Toronto. And of course, to find out how the other shoes fared, watch Marketplace tomorrow night at 8, 8.30 in Newfoundland on CBC Television, or you can stream it anytime on CBC Jeff. Ahead tonight, nothing spooky about this costume. Not only did this seven-year-old dress up like his hero, he is following in his footsteps too. But first. In case you missed it, for most of us, it's only Halloween once a year. But for the Gormeisters at Masters FX, it's kind of always Halloween. Zombies, dead bodies, um, we have animals, you know, all kinds of all kinds of goodies. It's not that your average office. So to mark the day, we popped into this Toronto special effects company to learn how they scare, shock, and just gross people out in everything from movies to hit TV shows like The Handmaid's Tale. And spoiler alert, they are really good at what they do. Pull out this guy's Pull. eyeball. See, these guys are so talented, they've even had a couple of accidental run-ins with the law. Yeah, twice this year we've had uh, tactical police called because we were moving some of our um, dead bodies and cadavers and stuff. You know, he saw right away what was going on and what we do. You know, so he called off the other four um, police officers that were on their way. So here's a great horror movie idea. Cops show up at a warehouse thinking it's full of bodies, only they find out it's actually a special effects company, and then find out the special effects guys have just turned into zombies. Not bad, right? Happy Halloween. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, as California burns, we ask about the future of a state where wildfires are becoming more frequent and more intense. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to our national newsroom in Vancouver. 74 people are dead and dozens more injured following an explosion and fire on a train in Pakistan. Some passengers were cooking breakfast on a stove inside the train. An official apparently had told them to stop, but at least one of two gas canisters blew up. Three of the train's cars were destroyed. Stoves aren't permitted on trains in Pakistan, but people sometimes sneak them on for long journeys. ISIS is signaling it won't be deterred by the death of its leader. Today, the group confirmed the death of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi in an audio release. It also named his successor. Abu Ibrahim al-Hashimi al Qureshi al will take over for Baghdadi, who died during a raid by U.S. and Kurdish forces. ISIS says a spokesperson for its group also died during Sunday's raid. At least 20 people have been killed in protests in Chile. This was the scene in Santiago today. The protest began almost two weeks ago over a price hike to subway tickets. The fare change has since been suspended, but now people are demanding better pay, pensions, schools, housing, and medical care. Eight key cabinet ministers have resigned, and now many protesters are demanding the president step down as well. And a major automotive merger to tell you about. Italian-American manufacturer Fiat Chrysler has agreed to merge with France's PSA Group, which owns Peugeot. The $66 billion company would be headquartered in the Netherlands and would become the fourth largest car maker in the world. The move is intended to help both companies manage a global drop in business and enable them to invest more in new technologies like electric cars and self-driving. Time for a quick break. When we come back, Ryan Strashnitsky prepares to travel to Thailand for a medical procedure. You'll hear from the humbled bus crash survivor next. May 14th, uh, new week, more physio, and the CLD goes. Ryan Strashnitsky has come a long way since the Humboldt Broncos bus crash left him paralyzed from the chest down. Oh. Okay, now push forward, push forward, push forward. 
Through hard work, he's gained enough strength to compete in sledge hockey, something Adidas found inspiring. But he and his family want to set the bar higher. On Saturday, he leaves for Thailand for a medical procedure that could bring marked improvement, though it's experimental. Carolyn Dunn asked what they dare hope for. Of everything Tom and Ryan Strashnitsky will pack for their trip to Thailand, Ryan's pair hockey sled is perhaps the most important. Making me lug that in Thailand, eh? After all, his big goal is to make the Paralympic team. I don't want to get rusty, so when I get back, I'm still in game shape. Ryan is scheduled for surgery on Monday. He's among a small number of Canadians to have an epidural stimulator implanted for spinal injury. It will go just below the injury that left him paralyzed from the chest down. We operate as an outpatient clinic. Ryan is Wen Nguyen's second patient to have this surgery. The thought is that there's still some connections that are preserved. So with this device and with the implant, um, what we're wanting to do is to excite and activate the connections that are dormant. Big step, Kurt. It's a surgery that's been approved for pain control in Canada for decades, but not yet approved by Health Canada for spinal injury improvements. There's always a risk in going overseas for treatment, but Nguyen has been to the Thai hospital and believes the surgery will help. What we're hoping that Ryan will gain is some voluntary control below his level of injury and also to gain improvement in autonomic function, so whether it's kind of bowel and bladder, digestive, pain, any of those things. So Ryan will have the $125,000 surgery in Bangkok. He hopes it will help improve his core control for para hockey as well as assisted standing. All right, say hi to Conroy for me. His parents have an open mind about what success looks like. Ultimately, of course, uh, for him to be able to walk again. But in the meantime, we'll take core an improvement in his quality of life from the beginning we said whatever it takes we're going to do whatever we need to do ryan still has the determination that propelled him to junior a hockey One, two, three. in less than a year he's been named to a team of tier one players representing canada at a prestigious u.s para hockey tournament next month he'll miss it because of his surgery in thailand there's a lot of mixed emotions. Nervousness is definitely one of them, and you know, excited is another. Unexpectedly, Ryan will get to train on ice in Thailand. I've had a couple emails where they do have ice in shopping malls, so they offered that to me, and you know, I'm going to take advantage of that, and I'm super thankful. He'll want to go on the ice, well, every day, and that'll be his focus, and it'll get his mind off uh, other things, right? So actually, I think it'll be a huge healing help. Ultimately, he'll find his comfort where he does these days, on the ice, even if it's 12,000 kilometers from home. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Airdrie, Alberta. And coming up on The National, our moment. One boy decides to skip the candy and raise money for cancer research. Instead, the story behind his costume is next. Trick-or-treat. Just look at all those trick-or-treaters. Hoping to get a good haul of candy, despite many cities across the country having quite a bit of rain. But one boy decided to raise money for cancer research instead. Inspired by his hero, Terry Fox. And for his treat, he got the chance to chat with Fox's brother. And that is our moment. Hello, everybody. My name is Ethan. For this year, for Halloween, I'm being t my hero, Terry Fox. So what, what have you been up to lately? Um, raising money and stuff. Which is... so what, what made you decide to dress up like Terry and, and do all this fundraising? It was Terry Fox Day at my school. It got me curious. I got off the bus and told Mom I wanted to Just be Terry Fox for Halloween and raise money for cancer research. Finish what Terry Fox done. We raised like two hundred and three hundred dollars in just an hour and a half. Zero. I'm hoping to raise like ten million. It's so amazing to know that uh, a young young guy like you is, is doing this and raising money for cancer research. I'm gonna be like doing this for a while. I don't know how long 
I'm gonna be doing this thing for, but yeah, I'm gonna do it for a while. <laughs> you know, Adrian, I'm slightly obsessed about things that are truly, absolutely, uniquely Canadian, because we're a country that's influenced by so many other countries around the world. Terry Fox is one of those things that is uniquely Canadian. And we remember mm -hmm. his run across the country, given our ages. Totally. Uh, but fantastic that a kid that young would be inspired by Terry's story. And it's interesting, if, if people saw there that uh, the piece of paper that said that he had raised 12000 that was just when those pictures were taken. It's now up to... 19,000. And Canada's kind of a small town, right? That this kid could reach Terry Fox's brother and Skype him. That's also kind of charming. Yeah, and, I, and what a gift for Fred Fox, too. Uh, Ian, uh, he's, Ethan asked him, you know, what do you miss about your brother? And he said, you know, that he would, he would love this. <laughs> that is a national for October 31st, Halloween. Good night. Good night.